Growing up, I never thought that I would give up eating meat or any other animal product for that matter. But for a while now, I've been eating a much more plant-based diet, just eating meat on rare occasions. And it's been far easier than I thought. It's far easier than I ever imagined. It turns out that it makes a big difference, not only for animals, but for the planet too. In fact, that was my main driving motivation. And researchers at the University of Oxford found that cutting meat and dairy products from your diet could reduce an individual's carbon footprint from food by up to 73%. And additionally, if everyone stopped eating animal products, global farmland use could be reduced by 75%, which would not only lead to a significant drop in greenhouse gas emissions, but would also free up land lost to agriculture, which is one of the primary causes for mass wildlife extinction. Now, if these arguments for eating more plants aren't compelling enough, that's super fair, but today's guest might just change your mind. This is Sounds Good. I'm Brandon Harvey. Our guest today is Jean Stone, a respected writer and journalist who has spent the past decade writing about plant-based diets. He has degrees from Stanford and Harvard, he volunteered in the Peace Corps, and he's worked with publications including Esquire, GQ, and Vogue. He's written or ghostwritten more than 50 books, and you might recognize some of the titles like Forks Over Knives, The Engine 2 Diet, and Eat for the Planet. Most of Gene's writing focuses on plant-based diets and the relationship to health, animal protection, and the environment. And I sat down with Gene to talk about why adopting more plant-based foods into our diet can maybe make a difference in the world and how we can all start small with his simple action steps. So without any further ado, let's just dive straight into this conversation. I want to start off by asking you, what is happening in the food world right now? Because I've been thinking about it a lot. And growing up, I only knew one person who was vegan and her parents were total hippies. And I personally never thought that I'd cut meat out of my life, but I've been mostly vegetarian for some time now. Maybe one day we'll get to the point of vegan. We'll see if this conversation changes things for me. Um, But I'm also just seeing more plant-based alternatives than ever before. We're seeing all kinds of celebrities, athletes, influencers choosing to eat vegan. And so my question for you is, why this cultural shift and why now? You know, it's funny. I became vegan maybe 14 or 15 years ago. And when I did, I did it to write a book with my pal Rip Esselstyn, who's a vegan firefighter, now um, a food producer down in Austin. And when I started doing it, it was like people are going, do you have an f- eating disorder? I mean, why are you doing this? And they didn't even know the word vegan. They just called it vegan or whatever. So that was only 14 or 15 years ago. And it's just extraordinary what's happened since then no longer an eating disorder. Now now it's kind of aspirational and people really want to do it. I think um, if I had to figure it out, it has a lot to do with the fact that there are four reasons people go vegan. It's for health, for animal protection, for the environment, and for athletic performance. And those are four pretty big categories that interest an awful lot of people, particularly health. Um, More and more books are being written about the enormous advantages of a plant-based diet. Um, So I would say that the 40-somethings and over are really looking at health, whereas my niece, for instance, who's 25, she went vegan because she feels really strongly about the environment. And we all now know that animal agriculture is one of the worst polluters on earth. So yeah, you have these four different pillars. And I think that because they're all so important, that's probably the major reason that veganism has grown so much in the last 10 years. What was the original inspiration for you to go plant-based? Uh, and I can also answer this after you answer for, uh, for me. Well, for me, you know, I, and I feel so terrible about this because it's one of those people who always said, 
oh yeah, man, I love animals. And then <laughs> eating them, you know, um, how much did I love them if I ate them? Um, but again, when I met this uh, Rip Esselstyn and I started yeah. writing his books, what happened is that um, I began to think, well, if I'm going to write a book with Rip, then I need to at least try this thing out. And he was such a great coach that within a month, I figured, yeah, you know, this is really good. And it was all about health. But then through RIP, I met some of the people involved in animal protection, like Gene Bauer from Farm Sanctuary or Ingrid Newkirk from PETA. And then I put together, oh, you know, um, I really love animals. So it's not just about health. It's about animals. And then I met a guy, Neil Zacharias, and we were both talking about the influence of the environment. So that became still one more reason to do it. Unfortunately, I'm not a professional athlete, so <laughs> my performance part of it wasn't really one of my pillars. But yeah, all those things came together for me, just as I think they've been coming together for other people. How did you become a vegetarian? So for me, uh, a few years ago, I was actually, at, this is like a little name droppy, but I was at a conference speaking and one of the other speakers was Rich Roll, who you may know. Oh, sure. Rich is great athlete, author, iconic podcaster. And he was, of course, ordering you know something fully vegan. And I ordered something that was not. And I was asking him about it. And he's just such a generous, friendly guy. I was kind of walking through like, oh, I do care about the environment. I guess I kind of care about animals. I care about health. And I can tell that obviously the health thing is working for you as like a ultra athlete. Uh, maybe I'll start one day. And he goes, why would you start one day? Why don't you start tomorrow. <laughs> and I, I'll tell you, I didn't start that next day. That would have been a great story. I did not start that next day, but that really did stick with me. He's like, if those are your values, then like, why not just start tomorrow and figure it out as you go? But the reason that I, I ended up actually making the transition was just reading the data about the environment. And for our listeners, you know, they may have read our print newspaper, the good newspaper, and we had an edition called the sustainability edition. And way more had to do with food than I ever expected when we went into writing that issue of the paper. We literally had a food edition that talked about food less, I would dare to say. And so that was kind of the catalyst for me. And and since then, it's been more of just an adventure. It's been fun. I've been loving exploring, trying new things. The novelty of it is actually really fun for me. We have 72 reasons to be vegan. I think that each one of them is an important reason. They are divided up into these different categories. But for the, for the most part, when I'm talking to people like you who are already kind of there, what I'm usually trying to say, it's great you're there. And we don't expect people just to all go vegan overnight. But we do hope that like if you read a book like ours and you, and you think more about it, you know, you'll just go, you know, I do love animals and I don't really like the idea that they're being slaughtered the way they are. Or, you know, I'm getting a little older and I am starting to worry maybe about making sure my body is in good shape. Um, but as I, do, as I said, the environment is really, I think, one of the driving forces for people under the age of 40, because there just is no question that um, animal agriculture is just really, really bad for the environment. And we all know that the environment is in trouble now. We're kind of talking these big general categories. And it's so interesting that you you just outlined the categories because I was going through the book and I was creating my own categories and I came up with the exact categories that you did. I'm wondering if you could kind of give almost like four little mini spoilers to the book, uh, one for each category so that we can zoom in a little bit, you know? So for the first one being, you know, what is one reason to go vegan that's specifically for the environment? Well, one of our chapters is called It's Cheaper and Better Than Buying a Tesla. And, and we talk about how the total greenhouse gas emissions associated with a single charbroiled hamburger is equal to driving an 18-wheeler for 143 miles. No. <laughs> and by the way, I just we, we've carefully footnoted every single fact like this in this book. This isn't stuff we've just simply made up. This is all data that we have compiled and, and, and footnoted. For animal protection, we talk about the obvious, but we also go into some of the kind of sweeter things like pigs are smarter than a three-year-old child. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite chapters is chickens like to be cuddled. Oh, <laughs> that's so sweet. My favorite chapter is cows love classical music. 
I love the idea that somebody wanted to do an experiment to find out if cows love classical music because it's a weird intersection of multiple interests and they somehow got funding. It sounds like (laughs) exactly health is an obvious one. And we talk a great deal about where healthy fats come from. We have a chapter called fiber is your body's bitch. And we explain why fiber is so important to your body and you only really get it on a plant-based diet. Meat is not going to do it. And of course, We do talk about athletic performance, and we talk about some of the athletes like Rich Roll who have discovered that a plant-based diet really improves their performance. In fact, Rip Esselstyn, the guy who got me to go vegan, he was one of the country's leading um, triathletes for many years, and he found that it did wonders for his performance. It's extraordinary, actually, how many triathletes have have gone uh, plant-based, I would say, over the the last 10 years. But it's also, you know, sometimes people think, oh, well, you know, that's all fine because they're skinny little people. But we also (laughs) have discovered a number of bodybuilders. Mr. Germany, Mr. Bodybuilding Germany, Patrick Amiam, he was um, a vegan too. And um, in fact, one of my friends is a guy named Big Bald Mike, who is a 500-pound vegan. So if you're worried that you're going to lose weight being a vegan, you should go check out on Google, big bold mic, and you'll see. Nope, that can happen. That is amazing, and and yeah, that's such a good little snippet and a little taste of the book. And what I love is that you do kind of just get to flip through the pages randomly and pick out things. It's definitely been really helpful for me. And I guess kind of on a related note, you know, your book is called Seventy Two Reasons to Be Vegan. It's not Seventy Two Reasons to Eat a Bit Less Meat. And I'm curious what you'd say to those who don't feel like they can go all the way. They're like, oh, but what about blank? But I need blank. Blank is really important to me. What would you say to those folks? That's the most common thing we run into. Uh, We very seldom get people just saying, oh, I just read your book and I've given up meat entirely and everything. (laughs) We just say, look, you know, do what you can. What I tell people is try to be conscious of your food. That's all. Mm. Make conscious food choices. Think about where your food comes from. Think about what your food is doing to your body. Think about what your food is doing in the environment and and make your own choices. You know, maybe you want to go 80% plant-based. Maybe you want to go 90. Maybe you just want to add more plants. Um, It's great. Nobody's saying everybody has to go vegan now. Just think about your food more. I think, I, I don't know about you, when I was growing up, nobody thought about food. It was just, you know, you put in your plate and your mother said, eat everything. (laughs) <laughs> That's about it. That was probably the sum total of our conversation about the food. But, you know, food food is so important in so many different ways. And so I just urge people, think about it before you eat it. We are going to take a quick break. And when we come back, Gene will share simple action steps we can all take to transition to a plant-based diet. And as a hint, you don't have to quit eating meat cold turkey. Okay, we'll be right back. Sounds Good is sponsored by Libro FM. Libro FM is the company that lets you support a local bookstore every time you download an audiobook. Now, instead of getting audiobooks from the giant company that advertises on other podcasts, you can get access to more than 150,000 audiobooks and support a local bookstore with every download. I've been a Libro FM subscriber for a long time now, and I love it. I used to use that other company, and I made the switch from that other company, which will not be named, to Libro FM because it has all the same books. It has an amazing app. It's got the same price, but it makes a difference. Plus, as a special offer for Sounds Good listeners, Libro FM is offering two audiobooks for the price of one with your first month of membership with the code GOOD. There is no reason not to try it. There's no reason not to at least attempt the switch over to Libro FM. You don't lose anything by canceling your other subscription and switching to Libro FM. It's just a good choice. All you have to do to get access to two incredible audiobooks 
for the price of one is visit Libro.fm. That's L-I-B-R-O dot F-M. And use the promo code GOOD to get started with two audiobooks and to help support this show. Sounds Good is sponsored by Riff. Now, can you imagine taking peaches, avocados, and plums and throwing away the fruit only to use the pit? Well, that's exactly what's done with the coffee bean, which is actually not a bean, but a seed with a juicy pulp that surrounds the bean called cascara. And the problem is that 25 pounds of green coffee were produced globally last year. That's not a problem. That's delightful. But four times as much cascara was also produced as a byproduct. Most cascara is literally just thrown away, piled into mountains in landfills, producing methane gas equivalent to the emissions of 3 million cars each year. But the folks at Riff have created a solution. They're upcycling this delicious cascara into a carbon-neutral plant-powered drink called Energy Plus. Cascara is this incredible gift of nature. It's delicious, naturally sweet, and naturally caffeinated. And they have turned it into Riff Energy Plus Immunity, which has 120 milligrams of caffeine, a daily dose of vitamin C, and comes in three delicious flavors. Booyah Berry, Get It Guava, and Pick It Up Pomegranate. I know that in the past I've said that Pick It Up Pomegranate is my favorite, I did recently transition to a Booyah Berry Boy. That's my current favorite. I'm sticking with it until maybe one of the others become my favorite again. I have just been going through these in my fridge. I love them. And I hope that you love them too. And so you can go and learn more about Riff's mission and their new Riff Energy Plus Immunity by visiting letsriff.com. And then the amazing thing is you can use the code good, good, good for 20% off your order. One more time, that's the code good, good, good at letsriff.com. If somebody wanted to, after listening to this episode or after, you know, reading your book, wants to start taking those steps towards, you know, being more thoughtful about what they're eating, maybe take steps towards being vegan. What would be, if we were to like break this down into like a little three step process, what would be, you know, the three things for a listener to do or, or for me to do to, to take it all away, maybe? I think the first one is what I've said just a minute ago is think about what you're eating now, because I don't really think that most people do that. Uh, the second would be, um, what is it that you want to eat? You know, if you, if you want to eat something that tastes like meat, but you don't want to eat meat, look around for alternatives. Mm. Everybody's now heard about the Impossible Burger. Oh, it's so good. It's I, I served it to people and they didn't know it wasn't meat. You know, It's unbelievable. And if people have tried like fake meat things in the past and they didn't like it, uh, you will love the Impossible Burger. Like it truly will trick you. It's delightful. I will always get it anytime it's an option. But it isn't just uh, burgers that um, you can replace. There's... Uh, extraordinary cheeses made from nuts, uh, particularly a brand called Miyoko's. Mm. Uh, wonderful, wonderful cheeses that, again, I've served to people without telling them they were <laughs> cheese. So you can look around for these alternatives if you're not ready to simply have a totally plant-based diet that's composed only of fruits, vegetables, legumes, and nuts. But the other thing I would also add for a step is try to find some support. It is a lot easier if you're going to make a big dietary change if you're doing it with somebody or you talk to somebody about it or you reach out to somebody like me, I mean, I'm, my email address is out there and I get lots of questions and I'm happy, you know, to help anybody with any questions they have, because it is hard to do it alone. If you're going to make a change like that, the most successful people probably do it with other people, but plenty of people do it alone, but can reach out and ask so many of us online who are more than willing to help out. I think that's such a good point. And I think for me, I found it really helpful to connect with um, like vegan and plant-based influencers who are sharing about their journeys, sharing about what they're eating. I think that really helps for me. Same goes with uh, for folks who use Reddit. Like there's so many great people out there in 
you know, subreddits on Reddit who are, are sharing tips or you can ask questions. And then I found it really helpful that my wife isn't quite in the same place as me. Like she'll still eat meat and stuff, but she will basically anytime that I cook a vegetarian meal, like she'll opt for that. When we're at restaurants, she'll opt for, you know, vegetarian meals whenever possible. And just having somebody who is understanding and, and sympathetic and maybe on her own journey with that, that has been super helpful. So it, it does, it isn't even that you need like a super vegan best friend. It's just that you need supportive people in your life and you need resources and people to turn to if you have questions or ideas or you're processing it. And as you pointed out, the internet is an extraordinary source of <laughs> and information. Another thing you can do is there are vegan meetups uh, probably in almost every major and probably minor town in America. So another way is to um, not only get some advice from people, but you can make some new friends. That's a great point. And now that you know we're all starting to get vaccinated, we're all going to be going back out into the world and we can we can meet up with people. We can go to maybe restaurants soon and we can be thoughtful about you know what we get at restaurants and uh, we can also start having friends over and we can cook them vegetarian meals and maybe we don't even have to tell them. There's all kinds of ways to, to be more thoughtful in this new world we're entering back into. Restaurants an interesting point. I'm in California where I think as of even maybe just today, we've gone from 10% to 25% and on our way up to 50%. Wow. If you go to a restaurant and you don't see something you like, um, ask. You can always ask the waiter to create a vegan meal um, before um, COVID and actually a little before even some of the restaurants were as clued into it as they are now. I would just simply say, look, you know, I'm vegan. Can the chef make me a vegetable plate of some sort? And I was never in a situation where <laughs> the restaurant said, no, leave. You know, they want your business. They want you, you know, they want you to like the place. So I've had some of my best meals at very non-vegan places. In fact, I've often found that steakhouses serve great vegan meals because they tend to have onion rings and spinach and french fries and all the accoutrements to go with steak. I just don't eat the steak. That's such a great point. And I honestly do love doing that when it when it doesn't feel rude to do it, to be able to just say like, hey, make me whatever you want to make me. I think that oftentimes I found that uh, restaurant work is kind of like that. I can't speak for everybody. I'll also say though, I live in Portland, Oregon, which is probably a plant-based Mecca. And so I, I forget that there are restaurants that don't serve delicious, iconic, fully vegan meals. You no, know, I get a lot of questions from people who live in, you know, Iowa City or Omaha. And I say, look, yeah, I know most of your friends are eating steak. Most of your restaurants are serving meat. But, you know, a lot of chefs are actually intrigued. In fact, one of the reasons that plant-based food has done so well recently is so many chefs, you know, they've been doing the same thing forever with mm. the meat, the dairy. The idea of creating these extraordinary meals just using vegetables and fruits and legumes is a challenge to them, and it's interesting. And a lot of these TV shows that used to only feature animal uh, products are now doing these extraordinary meals with vegetables. What I've been enjoying about going plant based is I just like trying to cook new things, and it, you know, it was so easy to cook chicken or salmon or whatever that it just got boring. And uh, I've learned so many new kitchen skills. It's really fun. And I hope that others get to experience the same thing. Yeah, uh, we do have in the, uh, you know, you know, I have to say the name of the book, 72 Reasons of course. to Be Vegan, because who knows when they, oh, and by the way, a radio show is a little bit like this book. One of the things that we wanted to do in this book is allow people to just Tune into the book whenever they want. So there isn't an order. You can pick it up on page 70 or you can pick it up on page 140. There's no particular order. We want people just to be able to read it from, you know, whenever they feel like it, maybe, you know, in the bathroom for a couple <laughs> of minutes or like on a subway train. Um, it's, it's here to guide you, but only as you want it to guide you. Yeah, it's really cute and skinny. And I just left it out on my coffee table for the last month because I got it early. And I've just been loving like picking it up, flipping through it. It's really cute and delightful, beautifully designed. Um, <laughs> I just, I am definitely going to steal a few visual ideas if I ever write a book because it's a very fun way of laying out all the information. Yeah, we had a lot of fun working with the publisher Workman on this because they are a very graphic company. They really understand how to make um, print jump off the page. Mm. So I think they did a great job making the book look like fun. Mm. 
That's Gene Stone, journalist and New York Times bestselling author. Check out his many, many books. He's written or ghostwritten more than 50 titles wherever you buy books. And specifically, pick up 72 Reasons to Be Vegan. Why plant-based? Why now? It's truly a delightful and informative book. This podcast was created by Good Good Good. At Good Good Good, we help you feel more hopeful and do more good. You can find more good news and ways to make a difference in our weekly email newsletter, our beautiful print good newspaper, or online at goodgoodgood.co. This episode is created by Kaylee Thompson, Megan Burns, and me, Brandon Harvey. It was edited and sound designed by the team at Sound On Studios. You can find out more about their work at soundonsoundoff.com. If you want to support this show, you can do two things. First, just make sure that you hit the follow button wherever you listen to podcasts so that you can catch every episode the day it comes out. And second, for your favorite episodes, if you can share them on social media, text them to friends, do whatever it is that you do, that will really help more people find the show. The best way that people find podcasts in 2021 is personal recommendations from people they trust. So if you love the show, help more people find good news and ways to take good action. And with that, that is a wrap for this week's episode. Go out and try a delicious plant-based food you've never tried before. And we'll be back next week with more good news and good action. Sound good?